halting oracle, um, and that can only predict machines without a halting oracle. So, like, Solomonoff induction can't predict an environment that contains Solomonoff induction. And we might, like, try to fix this by saying an oracle, um, uh, we give it an oracle that returns, instead of a halting oracle, an oracle that returns zero or one. If the program that we feed to the oracle returns zero or one, and it can return either thing if the program goes into a loop. But this also, like, doesn't work. And the way to see this is, suppose that um, by quining, uh, I write the self-referential program that asks the oracle, so what do I return? And if the oracle says zero, then it returns one. And if the oracle says one, then it returns zero. Since the oracle always returns, this program does in fact return, but like it can't return either, uh, like neither zero or one is consistent. Uh, and we'll, we'll take this and we'll sort of actually fix this uh, by, by doing something slightly different. Um, I quickly want to say, like, why do we want Solomonoff induction to predict itself? Well, because we want to have an agent in the actual world that predicts things that happen in the actual world. And the actual world can't contain Solomonoff induction, but it can contain other things, other predictors that are as powerful as our agent uh, or our predictor. And somehow our predictor has to deal with the situation, and we would like to know what's the theory of that. So, our new thing, reflective oracles. So, uh, instead of using Turing machines, um, uh, the things we feed to our reflective oracle are, reflect are probabilistic oracle machines, which means they're Turing machines which can flip coins and call our oracle. So that's where the self-referentiality comes in. We can actually feed things to this oracle that themselves can call the oracle. And the oracle answers some questions randomly, so there's randomness also coming from there. Um, and I'll write, uh, like, notation, I'll write uh, m to the o equals 1 to say that um, the machine uh, m, when run with the oracle o, returns 1, and then this p of that is like the probability given the coin flips that the program makes and the calls to the oracle that it makes. I should say, like, the next two slides are going to be, like, a bit technical because I, like, want to give you an impression of what's going on here on a technical level. But if you sort of, like, if it's a bit impressionistic, that's sort of, like, fine and you can look in the paper for details. Reflective oracles. So the reflective oracle, when we call it, takes three inputs. It takes a machine, it takes some input string to that machine, a finite string, and it takes a probability. And roughly, it asks, uh, uh, the question to the oracle is, when I call this machine on this input, is the probability that it returns a 1 greater than p? So the oracle always returns either 0 or 1. And in some cases, it's allowed to answer probabilistically. And the rules uh, that it does have to follow is if the probability that the machine returns a 1 is actually greater than p, then the oracle has to return 1. And if the probability that the machine returns zero is greater than one minus p, then the oracle actually has to return zero. So in other words, like if the machine always halts, then uh, this condition says that if the probability that it returns one is smaller than p, um, then the oracle has to return zero. But if the probability is exactly p, or if the machine sometimes, hold, uh, sometimes doesn't halt and it's sort of there's, then there's sort of a space of piece for the, which of this is true, then the oracle can actually answer randomly. And this helps us get rid of these diagonalization problems that I suggested on the previous slide. So here's an example. Uh, suppose that I ask the oracle, like I write a program that asks the oracle, hey, what do I do? Do I return zero and one? Um, and then it does the opposite. So the way we do this is we ask the oracle, is the probability that I return one greater than 0.5? And if so, I return zero, and otherwise I return one. And so this is like not a contradiction to this kind of oracle, uh, because in fact the probability can be exactly 0.5, um, and then neither of these two conditions apply, and uh, because like it's neither greater than 0.5 nor smaller than 0.5, and so it's actually allowed for the oracle to return uh, with 50-50% probability zero or one, which means that our program also returns with 50-50% probability 0 or 1, and it works out. Um, and we do have a proof uh, that's referenced in the paper that reflective oracles do in fact exist. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details. Reflective Solomonoff induction. 
So um, in reflective Solomonoff induction, um, the way we formalize it is a hypothesis is now a probabilistic oracle machine, which takes as input the bit string that has been seen so far and returns the next bit. So in other words, like uh, the probability distribution of that next bit is the conditional probability distribution given the input so far. And we can ask the oracle about this conditional probability distribution. And um, now, probabilistic oracle machines don't necessarily halt. And so reflective Solomonoff induction can't actually run a probabilistic or arbitrary probabilistic oracle machine. But given a probabilistic oracle machine M, we can construct another probabilistic oracle machine N that does always halt, and the probability that N returns zero or one is at least as large as the probability that M returns zero and or one. So if like M returns zero with probability 0.4, M returns uh, one with probability 0.5, and M loops with probability 0.1, then I can have like probabilities 0.45 and 0.55 for n, but they, for n they have to like sum up to one because n can't loop. And the way that it works is um, I do some binary search, like first I flip a fair coin, if it's heads, then um, like I ask the, uh, uh, ask the oracle is it greater or smaller than 0.5, and if it's greater I return one, if it's smaller I return zero. Um, and if it's tails, then I sort of like split the space. I go to 0.25 or 0.75 instead of 0.5, and I start over. Uh, the, the details are in the paper, and um, it has this property. So here's how reflective Solomonoff induction actually works. Um, it samples a non-looping machine N. Uh, it, it takes, uh, reflective Solomonoff induction also takes as input the bit string so far and gives like the, the next bit with, uh, with the probabilities given by so this version of Solomonoff induction. So I sample a non-looping machine N, uh, that is I sample a, looping, uh, a possibly looping machine M and construct this machine N in this way as in the previous bullet point. And I use rejection sampling um, where I compute, the pr using the oracle I can compute the probability that N produces the bit string that I've seen so far. Um, and I accept N with this probability, otherwise start over. And uh, this is like equivalent, um, and, and like if I accept, then I, then I call n and output what it outputs. And uh, this rejection sampling um, uh, terminates with probability one and it computes the, um, the correct um, conditional probability of the next bit given the input so far and given my, my prior over machines. Um, so reflective Solomonoff induction can reason about worlds which themselves um, call reflective Solomonoff induction because reflective Solomonoff induction is actually a machine of the same form. Uh, it's a probabilistic oracle machine which takes as input what it has seen so far, which outputs the next bit, and um, uh, which, which always halts. It's constructed so that it always halts. So if you like, take it as M and construct the corresponding N, uh, it like, doesn't change the behavior. Um, so, um, uh, so an example of like, um, what, uh, how you could try to like, make a diagonalization argument, how you could try to like, turn it on itself, is uh, to make an environment where you like, predict the next bit um, and uh, uh, ask it, like, is it probability more or less than 0.5 that the next bit is a one? And then you feed it as the next input the thing that it thought was less likely. And in fact, we have to deal with that situation if we want to have like, a theory of Solomonoff-like predictors in the real world, because you can do that in the real world. You can, like, if, if you have a computer program that gives you probabilities, you can run it, you can figure out what does it think is less likely, and then you can give it that, and it has to produce some output. So um, there's a theorem which is like the same as for standard Solomonoff induction, uh, that uh, reflective Solomonoff induction converges to making perfect predictions on any environment that is in its hypothesis space. And in this case, that includes this one, because uh, it is in its own hypothesis space. Um, and what, it, what actually happens uh, sort of makes sense. Uh, um, and the, the thing, the way that we can like, use probabilities here is because our environments are themselves probabilistic. Um, and so what happens is that the probability that the next bit is a one is exactly 0.5, uh, 
And so when, when you use the oracle to ask, is it greater or smaller than 0.5, the oracle can ask randomly and uh, can answer randomly. Um, and then you actually input zero or one into the machine uh, uh, with probability 0.5. So the machine did in fact make a perfectly correct prediction about the probabilities in this framework. And um, so that's reflective Solomonoff induction. Analogously, you can define a reflective variant of IXE, uh, which has hypotheses containing other reflective IXEs. Um, uh, particular, like uh, it can deal with worlds which contain other agents like itself. And if it learns that it is in one of these worlds, which isn't guaranteed in the same way as for Solomonoff induction for reasons that apply to Ixe in exactly the same way, but if it learned that it is in one of those worlds, then roughly speaking, it would play a Nash equilibrium. Like if it knew exactly that it was in one of those worlds, it would play a Nash equilibrium. It never knows exactly, so it's only like approximate or something. Um, and in fact, the proof that I mentioned that reflective oracles exist is closely related to Nash equilibrium. There's an IXTL-like thing that you can do and a version of reflective oracles that's kind of IXTL-like. And in that case, you can actually prove the existence by like finding a Nash equilibrium of a particular game. There's, there's a reference to this in the paper. All right, so. Um, Ixe and Solomonoff induction are like uh, definitions of what a perfect agent or predictor would be like. Um, I'm like uh, not convinced, uh, I shouldn't say I'm sure that it's not exactly right, but like I'm pretty sure, no, I'm pretty sure. Uh, like there are problems with this. Um, for example, the fact that it like is hard to see, uh, even our version of Ixe is sort of like being made out of transistors in a world um, uh, where things are like made out of atoms. Uh, but I think Ixe and Solomonoff induction are like a large step forward towards like a theory of uh, superintelligent agents. Um, and in the real world, the environment can contain equally powerful systems. Standard Ixe and Solomonoff induction can't handle this, um, uh, at least can't handle this in a theoretically nice way. And uh, this work extends this to deal with that situation. So now you might say, well, that's very nice, but like the real world doesn't contain any reflective oracles. Now, of course, I agree with that. Um, but um, so the way that I think about it, like what real world systems will need to do is have mathematical uncertainty about what other agents will, need, uh, will do. And I think that reflective Solomonoff induction IXE are a step towards this kind of theory. And like, I don't feel that we are there, but I feel like compared to like where I was a year ago, I feel that this has like given me new insights and new paths to pursue towards like trying to figure out that theory. Thank you very much for your attention.